ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session of your Atom Research for All in the well-named Loveless Room. Lady Loveless was a mathematician, a lady well ahead of her time, and so I think it's a very, very fitting uh, uh, venue for uh, talking about uh, your atom science for all. I'm not going uh, to waste any time. Um, I'm going uh, just uh, to um, introduce how the session is going uh, to uh, to develop. Uh, we have uh, here three distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, Monsieur Bigot, Director General of the ITER organization. Uh, uh, Monsieur Eric Van Valle, of Director General of the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, SCKCN. Um, Monsieur Patrick Child, Deputy Director General in DG Research Innovation. And our uh, moderator, uh, Nathan Peterson from the, um, the Euro, uh, Young Nuclear Society. Thank you very much. So the essential will be, I will leave now the floor to Patrick, uh, um, Monsieur Bigot and Eric, and then there will be a Q&A session moderated by Nathan. Uh, so please, Patrick. So Elena, thank you, thank you very much uh, for uh, that introduction, and I'm really happy to be here with uh, our distinguished colleagues who I hope are going to uh, guide us through a very rich uh, discussion on um, uh, the sort of place of uh, nuclear uh, research in our overall um, uh, program, and in particular, you know, I think that uh, uh, the the whole event that we're we're celebrating here, the Research and Innovation Days, the preparation for the new Horizon Europe um, program, as well as the the ongoing discussions in the Council and um, on the new Euratom uh, regulation, you know, I mean, it's a really good time for us to be here together talking about these things. I mean, the level of ambition that we have, um, in particular, if we listen to the, uh, the political guidelines of President-elect uh, van der Leyen for the new commission, you know, this overarching strategy of a green deal uh, for Europe, bringing together all the different strands of our work, whether it's uh, you know, the work we're doing on research and innovation, uh, efforts to lead the global debate on climate change, uh, but also to... Uh, carry this forward with our citizens, uh, the impact on our, on our societies of the sort of scale of the, uh, of the ecological, economic and social transitions that lay ahead of us, um, but also as part of a, a modern and successful industrial strategy, which will enable us as a continent to rise to these challenges. So personally, I'm very, very much looking forward to um, uh, working within the, the, the new commission on this um, uh, new Green Deal, of which um, research and innovation, I'm sure, will be a, a very, very important part. I mean, the question, I suppose, for us today is, well, you know, what place is there for Euratom uh, and the established cooperation that we have on nuclear issues through the Euratom Treaty and more specifically through our research and innovation um, uh, uh, program and, and the research and education that we do? You know, what, what, what place is there for, for Euratom? And, and, and in particular, the question, you know, I suppose that's always for me is, um, you know, how do the timelines work? Um, you know, we, we, we're aiming now for full decarbonisation of the European economy by 2050, um, uh, and, and you know that's that's a very ambitious uh, challenge. Uh, but some of the big projects that we've got, I mean, for, I'm really great, uh, happy that uh, Mr. Bigo is here with us. I mean, ITER uh, will not, I think, have brought the full solution to Europe's energy challenges by 2050. So you know, where do where do we where do we fit into that equation, and how do we? sort of lead the necessary debate with our citizens, which we know can sometimes be challenging when it comes to nuclear issues, in order to make the case for a strong, vibrant and successful nuclear uh, industry in, in the European Union. Um, and I think that's you know, a little bit what the, the, the vision of the, the Euraptum uh, program is all about. It's creating a platform for us to work together at, at a European level on the things that we can work together on, knowing that not all member states have the same ideas, knowing that there are some member states that you know, will not be 
contributing very actively to the development of the next generation of nuclear technologies. Uh, but we have common interests, um, which I think are well captured in now the, the new set of objectives that we have in the Commission proposal for the regulation um, uh, for the, the Europe, uh, Euratom uh, research uh, program. I think it's really good news that we, we've got together now with the um, uh, colleagues in the, in the Joint Research Center and to have a common set of objectives. And you, you'll all know, I guess, that with the new setup in the commission, um, Commissioner Gabriel, our, our future commissioner responsible for youth and innovation, she will be working with us in DGRTD, but also with um, the, uh, the colleagues in the Education Culture Department and the Joint Research Center. And I think that that creates uh, an opportunity for, uh, for new dynamics. I think mean, you're familiar, I know, with the content of our, our proposal. Um, we, we, we have uh, uh, put forward a budget of um, 2.4 billion euros for the period 2021 to 2027, a uh, combination of the indirect and direct work that we do uh, with our calls for proposals, but also working with the um, uh, JRC in the areas of fission and, of course, the uh, the extremely substantial program of cooperation that we have on fusion, in particular working through the uh, Eurofusion uh, Consortium. Um, I mean, just to sort of take this opportunity to highlight a few of the, the new features of the program, I've already mentioned the, um, uh, the, the, the new sort of more focused consolidated set of objectives, which I hope will help us to you know, create a, a, a bigger sense of common purpose uh, across the sector. Uh, but we're also hoping to promote more of the sort of new applications of uh, nuclear technologies, particularly the non-power applications, building on what we've already been doing in, for example, the medical sector, uh, but also then into uh, in industrial applications, um, uh, agriculture and space research. Um, we're hoping to improve the ways that we deal with um, safe spent fuel and radioactive waste management and decommissioning. And decommissioning, as we know, is increasingly uh, you know, something that, that many of our member states are having to deal with, both nationally and where, where a degree of, I think, uh, European level cooperation will add uh, very clear benefits. Um, we will continue uh, to work uh, very actively on, on fusion. Uh, we have, I think, found a good solution uh, with our, our British friends to ensure the continuity of the operations in jet uh, to take us through to the normal uh, end of, the, of, the, um, uh, of their, their present work program, uh, whatever happens in the um, uh, somewhat moving picture of um, politics in the country that I know best. And I don't propose that we discuss that in any more detail today. Um, uh, and, and just finally, um, another thing which I think is very important in the, um, in the proposals that we put forward and something I know that the, uh, that the industry has been looking, looking for uh, for some time, you know, we really have a focus on uh, ensuring that in Europe we preserve the next generation of nuclear professionals, nuclear scientists and people. Uh, and, and with that, uh, we in particular have proposed, and I think you know, there's now general acceptance, uh, that uh, the nuclear and... Um, uh, your atom activities should be brought within the scope of the uh, Marie Skogolska Curry scheme for uh, supporting uh, researchers. So, look, that's what I wanted to say a little bit to set the scene. Um, I, I, I'm uh, conscious that we have some uh, really heavyweight experts with us, and so I don't want to take more time. Uh, but, but that I hope gives a sort of flavour of what we're bringing to this discussion. You know, what we want to get out of it is a sort of clearer sense of direction. You know, a sort of spirit of co-creation. Of you know, once we have got the agreement politically, which I think is now emerging, although it's not yet fully there, with our member states on the new regulation, you know, how can we work together as a sector to exploit it uh, and have the most impact uh, in the coming period? So thank you very much, Luna. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick, for this uh, inspiring introduction. So now, uh, please, Bernard, the floor is yours. I think is that one. Yeah. yeah. Or you can... It's okay? Yes. Uh, or I could stand there. As you wish. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope there is uh, some slides which are coming which will be speak even better than yep. okay ah. the I get out of the way. I'm <laughs> aware that uh, <laughs> the world is facing a challenge is to find some alternate option to the burning of the fossil fuels. And uh, one of the ways to proceed uh, on this matter will be 
to develop what we call hydrogen fusion. And indeed, I am uh, leading now as a higher director general, inter organization director general, a large project which is not only just a European project, is an international project with indeed seven large uh, members re uh, representing more than 35 different countries. And you see here is a site where we are developing these uh, technologies with a, a, a larger uh, facility which is named ITER, Tokamak. I'm sure you are aware that uh, fusion, hydrogen fusion, is maybe the most uh, uh, largely distributed way of producing energy in the universe. It is what powers the sun and the stars, and for example, the sun is just a huge bubble of hydrogen, 300,000 times the weight of Earth, and at the center of, this, uh, of the sun, you have what we call a very dense plasma, the density is over the density of 100 times the density of steel. And at this density, you are forcing the hydrogen nuclei to get closer and closer. And when they get so close, you have nuclear forces which attract them and make them producing a new uh, element, which is helium, with a huge amount of energy. You could not reproduce easily this on Earth, you could imagine. So it's why the physicist has been bright enough to imagine something completely different. We will use a very low density plasma, a plasma with a density which is one million the density of the atmosphere. And in this condition, you are able to accelerate the hydrogen nuclei to make them colliding at a very high speed. And when they collide, they produce two particles, as in the sun, the neutrons, and okay, the helium atom uh, nuclei, with five or 20 times more energy than the energy you have to provide for the collision to be efficient. How could we do that? We need to have a speed which is equivalent to a temperature of 150 million degrees, 10 times the temperature of the sun. And in this condition, okay, you could not expect to have any vessel which could be sustained such a temperature. So what you do, you use the magnetic forces. You know the magnetic forces could exert their activities, their influence at distance. So you will confine the plasma at distance. What is good with the magnetic forces is also it will contribute to accelerate the hydrogen nuclei. I'm sure you remember maybe from the very basic physics course at the school that when you have a magnetic line and nearby an electrical particle, the electrical particle is captured by the magnetic line and continuously accelerating. So, if you want to reach the proper speed, you need enough space for accelerating before you collide with another particle. Is why we need a larger size in order to proceed. And is why we need cooperation on this matter. So here is the image of what we call the tokamak. Uh, you could see it is a torus. Okay, 1,500 uh, cubic meter, okay, with a plasma which will be all, uh, over 800 cubic meter, which will be, as I said, heated to 150 million. And uh, you have uh, the vessel which, uh, with its wall, which will collect the particle. The particle will hit the wall of the vessel, and they will be abruptly stopped, and they will transfer their kinetic energy to heat. Okay, producing heat, we will remove the heat with wood, water, we will heat the water, produce the steam, and the steam will okay, make the turbine producing electricity. So indeed, as a joke, it's just a boiler. It's a, a little bit advanced boiler, but it is what it is. And all the members have agreed to contribute to manufacture some of these components, which are absolutely huge. Around, for example, the vacuum vessel, you have what we call superconducting coils, which will be cooled down at minus 270 degrees. It will be the largest gap of temperature you will ever experience in the world. 150 million degrees there, minus 270 degrees there in just a few meters. So, where are we now? All over the world, the seven members are producing the different components. For example, the huge cryostat. The cryostat is a big box, 30 meter high, 30 meter diameters, in order to keep the cool down enough 
Okay, the uh, magnetic coils. You see the size of the magnetic coils, this size, this uh, magnetic coil, the second one uh, in the center from Europe and China, is being finished and uh, it's 10 meter okay, diameters, weighing nearly uh, okay, 300 uh, tons. And uh, some other coils are produced in Europe and will be up to 24 meter diameters. You see in Korea, they are producing the sectors of the vacuum vessel. We have break down, okay, uh, split the, tocam, the uh, torus, the vacuum vessel, uh, in nine parts, as like a piece of an orange, and we have to assemble this piece with a precision of millimeter. I don't want to go in, in much detail, just to show you that it's not just a dreaming program, it's now a real one, and we have now to assemble other components. And just because it is the purpose, maybe, of this uh, meeting, that even if this project is uh, focused in order to demonstrate hydrogen fusion, we have to develop a lot of innovative technologies in robotics, in uh, electronics, in uh, okay, material forming, in uh, uh, signal transmission at levels which have never been done before. So I was supposed to speak five minutes. I have, we are very frenetic with the ITER project to keep on schedule. So I try to make my best in order with that. So you see here is a site with the Tokamak building, which is nearly finished. Uh, behind you have this huge okay, black building, as you see now, which is what we call the pre-assembling building, where we will pre-assemble the component. When they will be pre-assembled, they will weigh nearly 1,500 tons, and we will position them like a candy in a box with a precision of below centimeter. And we are 60% over. Uh, what we expect uh, to co accomplish up to the first plasma by 2025 and the full fusion power producing 10 times more energy that we will feed in by 2035. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Bernard. Perfectly on schedule in more ways than one. Uh, please, Eric. Mm -hmm. Do you have any slides or is just... Um Okay, thank you for this very kind introduction, Mrs. Chair, and also, of course, thanks a lot to Bernard Bigot, whom I know quite well. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fusion is indeed the future. And as stated by Bernard Bigot, many challenges are still ahead, but clear progress, as you have seen, is made under his leadership to create the sun on Earth in Kadarash. But I was asked, to tell the role of fission. Mm. Fission, where we split an atom in two to generate energy and some neutrons. Real fusion, where we melt two light atoms together to generate energy, outrange fission at some time. Is fission, as looked by many in the society, an outdated technology today? Or does fission play an important role to come for fusion and for other applications? Let me tell you, fission is proven technology. Fission is key in present society and indispensable for a secure, bright future. After all, today, fission remains the first non-CO2 emitting electricity source in the, EU, in the EU. It is the basis of many breakthroughs that were acquired, and fission will be the basis of many of today's and tomorrow's innovations. At this moment, we fight climate change as the outstanding recognized danger of our planet. Consequently, this should be our primary goal today and tomorrow. As we all know, the EU has put tough standards on greenhouse gas emissions to be reached by 2030 and 2050. We thus need, or should I say, we should favor all sources of energy that can help to reach those emission goals. And believe it or not, but our present generations reactor two, and generations two and three of nuclear fission uh, power plants, they make the most efficient contribution for electricity production to reach this goal. We must strive to maximize that effort, especially if Europe wants to electrify our transport capabilities and our homes by the use of heat pumps. So, therefore, 
we also need to guarantee the safety of the nuclear power plants. And this must remain a big, big, uh, important step in our society. The EU has already taken numerous initiatives to support safety of these NPPs. Think here about, for instance, the Nugenia research agenda within SNETP. Plant life management beyond, it's a difficult thing to study. Oops. Okay. Plant life management beyond 40 years of operation is very actual, but it is a very realistic option for generation two nuclear power plants. It is implemented today in a number of EU countries and in the United States of America, and this while others, as was said by Mr. Chant, have chosen for new build or for closing down their generation two NPPs. And the latter puts the EU challenges on decommissioning technologies, waste and disposal issues, on site remediation that Europe needs as an important need for making research and industrial attention. Some of these are embedded in the projects EURAT and the SHARE program. Now, in operation or out of use, generation two and three fission power plants leave us with radiotoxic used fuel and nuclear waste which are of serious concern for society. And innovative, relevant solutions are under development, but they need Horizon Europe support to demonstrate their effectiveness. Which solutions? A number of pathways to tackle the used fuel and the highly activated waste are pursued within Europe today. They each have their outstanding value that when put together, they really contribute to the solution. First, Continued research, optimization, and implementation of deep geological disposal of highly activated materials is a must. Second, the implementation at industrial scale of partitioning and transmutation of the minor actinides present in used fuel can drastically reduce the radiotoxicity of the resulting waste. It does not omit, but it reduces the, the ecological footprint of the geological disposal. And Europe has some very recognized innovative institutes uh, for partitioning, for instance, Marcoul in France or the GRC Center in Karlsruhe. Belgium, on the other hand, develops the MIRA system, which is an accelerator driven system. Yes, this was the waste. I'm sorry, this, I'm not used to this thing. Okay, so Belgium is developing the MIRA system, uh, which is in fact recognized in the EU set plan and also within the S3 roadmap, and that project intends to demonstrate transmutation of minor actinides loaded fuel at semi-industrial scale. The innovative MIRA research reactor is based in fact on heavy metal lead bismuth coolant, and it is a fast neutron research <coughs> reactor with intrinsic safety by design. The MIRA reactor can be seen as an experimental technological test plant for the lead fast reactor technology, one of the generating for generation four fission nuclear reactors whose development is ongoing today in Europe. And of course, generation four reactors are all designed towards increased safety and higher efficiency. The fast neutron systems allows to close, allow to close the fuel cycle, thereby eliminating minor actinite issues. And some of these systems, they have co-generating capacities of heat and hydrogen production energy vectors that can reduce the CO2 footprint. But the generation four systems all operate at high temperatures, and most of them are fast neutron generating systems, as I said before. This brings EU challenges on innovative material and fuel development, challenges that bring us to one of the key components for future developments, the presence of fission-based research reactors within Europe where those materials can be qualified. In fact, Europe needs to prioritize its goals to maintain as much as possible the existing research reactors and moreover, to support the development of new ones like Mira, the reactor Jules Horovitz in France and Palace. The number of, of operating research reactors in Europe becomes scarce but be aware that they are the basis for all development. My statement even goes further. Maybe the most crucial development for the elaboration of the next generation of fusion reactors is the existence of appropriate fission-based research reactors. Although not always recognized by the community, 
Fusion needs fish and fast neutrons to develop its materials. But these research reactors are also the basis for other societal innovations of major concern for the health of our citizens. We need fission nuclei and the generated neutrons to produce medical radioisotopes. So far, these radioisotopes have most frequently been used for diagnostic purposes. However, nuclear medicine has reached a tipping point and over the past years, innovative therapeutic treatments are on the rise. In targeted therapy, the medical radioisotope is carried very near to the cancer cells in order to destroy them accurately with the isotope decays, when the isotope decays by emitting beta or alpha particles. Please remember that in 2018, worldwide, 18.1 million new cases and 9.6 million cancer deaths were registered. And the number today is growing. As such, the use of therapeutic or even better, theragnostic radioisotopes, mostly based on fission-related technology, is expected to increase drastically in the coming years. And of course, these novel and existing radiotherapies they are also creating additional opportunities within the EU for innovative research and development of the symmetry and radiation protection of patients and medical staff, as well as we can see here, unborn life. Europe has invested since long in R&D to ensure an advanced protection of men and environment from possible consequences of ionizing radiation. The established EU experience with networks such as Melody, Eurados, Alliance, Neris, Euramet, and more, it should be continued. After all, protection of people and our environment is of concern to all. And last but not least, as also mentioned by Mr. Child, the safe use of nuclear applications of fission or fusion-related research and the development of new innovative technologies that will increase the well-being of society need a continued effort to attract, to retain, and to educate and train students, researchers, and professionals, young or old. The achievement of the European education and training projects and networks such as ENIN+, ENETRAP, Petrus, Kinch, and I can go on forever, the knowledge transfer initiatives that were foreseen within different European joint projects such as EURAT and CONCERT and also the work done within the international frameworks such as the OECD and EA and the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna is of high value and essential for guaranteeing a competent workforce in nuclear applications in general, whether it be fission or fusion. Therefore, the mobility of cross-cutting education and training programs are to be strengthened to create and cherish talented people. Let us attract them in large, innovative, multidimensional projects related to fission and fusion applications. Let us invest, let us innovate and power the future with the necessary relevance, effectiveness, and efficiency, which, is sometimes, which are sometimes the weak factors of the EU, as it is today the aim of Horizon Europe. Thank you. Uh, for this complementary uh, vision. Um, Nathan, I think that uh, I leave now the floor to you so that we can maximize the time for discussion. Please. Okay. I, um, can we hear me? Am I yep. the mic on? Great. So just to set the scene um, why I'm here, I'm here representing the European Nuclear Society's Young Generation Network, which is actually um, a network of an uh, umbrella of nuclear societies from 21 um, countries in, in Europe, um, representing engineers, scientists, people in academia and students as well. Um, that's people who get involved outside their normal working day or, um, or, or as part of their job to really try and collaborate together and share lessons and, and really develop knowledge from, uh, from the bottom scale up and, uh, and interact with uh, various figures in the industry. So, um, I would like to 
ask a few questions that have been um, uh, discussed and I know are quite burning issues with some of the, the YGN community to some of her esteemed panel. Um, but I would also like to hand over to the audience to ask a few questions along the way. Um, there's no Slido or anything like that today, um, so we'll just need to put your hands up and we'll come round and we'll keep your questions short and sweet and focused and we'll try and get round as many as possible. Um, but if it's okay, uh, because I'm here, I'd like to start us off uh, with a question. Um, and the question is really related to quite a topical thing that's going on around the world right now, um, across all generations. Um, and it's really the aspect of climate neutrality. And uh, there's been a big um, statements that have been made recently about that, certainly in the EU, and driving towards climate neutrality for 2050. And um, I, I think it's important, and I'd be really interested to hear your views, um, in addition to the comments you've already said, um, about the importance of um, nuclear research and innovation uh, and being a part of driving forward to uh, achieve uh, climate neutrality in 2050. Um, I was wondering if there's any comments you'd like to, to add on top of what you've just presented. The question is uh, fundamental. Everybody knows that uh, before we discover the fossil fuel, the world was just relying on renewable energy, as we name them now. Renewable energy are all nearly coming from the sun, okay? which means hydrogen fusion in some way. What is the characteristic of uh, uh, sun, uh, solar uh, okay, energy when it comes to Earth? There is two basic features. One is intermittency, everybody knows that. The second is diffuseness, okay? The sun flux on Earth, on the average, is no more than 100, 150 watt per square meter. So when we discover the fossil fuel, which indeed is interim storage of solar energy, it concentrates the sun power, okay? It accumulates energy of sun on billions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And so now we are depleting these resources. The good point is now, okay, we are eight billion of inhabitants. Before the 18th century, the average age uh, life expectation was below 35 years, and now it's over 80. So when we want to move away from this fossil fuel burning, which as we know every day more it's just impacting climate and, uh, uh, and environment, we need alternate option. And from my point of view, the only, I am a physicist indeed, the only resources of energy is in the nuclear energy. Okay, the nuclear energy is what contains the most of energy and is why we need to take advantage of this. Uh, I am very familiar with fission. Uh, I know uh, that fission is, is an option uh, and many countries are now developing it and we need to uh, maintain as much as we can the capacity of use, okay, fission technologies, safe. But from my point of view, we need to use what we call uranium, okay? Uranium ore is not so largely distributed. Uh, uh, right now, all over the world is 5% uh, around or 6% of the electricity production which is coming from okay, fission product uh, on uh, something around 500, okay, nuclear power plant. If you want to multiply that by uh, just a factor of 10 to reach uh, the 50%, okay, uh, you will need much more resources. So is why I deeply believe that we need also to have uh, new technologies, very innovative clearly, is why it takes time to develop, but it could be of an option. So to come to your point, uh, I dream uh, of uh, renewable energies, but we need also to be serious Renewable energy will not be able to afford the full need of uh, the 8 billion and maybe sometimes uh, soon uh, 10 billion of inhabitants. With highly concentrated uh, towns, uh, we need to have also some alternate option for producing massive, safe, okay, economically competitive uh, uh, energy and uh, the most um, uh, efficient energy vectors, as you know, is, is electricity as much as we can. So is why I do believe that uh, nuclear energy is well qualified. Provide, 
provide, we keep on with very strict okay, uh, operation in such a way that safety is always first. Okay, so um, not, not too much to add because I think what Bernard said is of course true. We, I also think that we should try to accomplish as much as possible with, um, with nuclear fission today, but go to more advanced technologies and also cherish the ones that we even have uh, already today. One of, of, for me, the big issues is that when we talk about climate change, people make it much too complicated. We want really to reduce greenhouse Effect. So we have to look at the most efficient technologies to do so. And we get in all kinds of political, societal discussions, which I appreciate and which are important, but we forget by doing this that we forget the goal. We really forget the goal to reduce CO2 because we are talking so much that nothing is happening or no real, real things are happening. So I, I think we should be much more prioritizing and a little bit more aggressive in saying what we want to obtain. And I think the EU re really has a role to play there. Uh, it is of very, very important that we stretch this element. Otherwise, we will not, not reach it. And I have a lot of appreciation for Bernard, but also, of course, for the, the ITER project and fusion projects. But we cannot imagine fusion to be there by 2050. We, it will be 21, well, 2100, maybe even later, when it will be there. Know, sooner, sooner. sooner, yeah, okay, the first effects will be there, but in a commercial way, okay, sooner. If by 2050 we want to reach, we, we really need to continue to develop fission technology today. And if we don't want to accept that, of course it has to be safe. And these are difficult things to discuss societally, but again, if we want to reduce CO2, it's very important. Also, what I think is very important is that we may not forget, we may not forget that a lot of countries, developed or underdeveloped countries, have access to gas, to coal, to a lot of fossil material. And because they cannot afford it, they don't have the technologies, if we don't spread them in a safe way, they will keep on using this capability and it will increase CO2. So we have to be very concerned about that. We really have to make a policy in order to try to convince them, which is, will be very, very difficult, to convince them to use other means. And again, I'm a physicist also. I believe in this nuclear power. Um, well, if I just add a word, I mean, yeah. um, I mean clearly, uh, nuclear is an important part of the energy mix of a number of EU member states, and I believe it will continue to be an important part of the energy mix of a number of member states. Um, it was also something that in the Clean Planet for All communication that the Commission adopted uh, about a year ago, where we first started you know, talking quite sort of um, aggressively about this objective of full decarbonisation by 2050, um, the scenarios for the sort of projected evolution of the energy mix included a dimension of uh, nuclear power, reflecting what I just said. Some people interpreted that as sort of uh, the European Union maybe setting targets or objectives for the sort of nuclear share of um, uh, in the energy mix. That is not the intention. It was just a sort of projection of the reality. And I don't think it helps in the present debate to sort of try and shift the interpretation of what we've said into a sort of target setting exercise. But, but I think that the recognition is there. And, and the fact that, you know, notwithstanding the political sensitivities of nuclear in the broader debate, which we are all familiar with, that the Commission um, was uh, realistic and clear in including the, a future share of nuclear in, 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 our, in our energy mix is, is an important recognition of the point of the question that you're making. Um, now, I mean, can we use that reality to shift public opinion, uh, to sort of shift the public debate in member states, which at the moment uh, are not so you know, open to a discussion on new generations of uh, fission technology or a part of nuclear in that? I don't know. We will see how the debate will develop. I think it is absolutely right at a European level to continue to put the very strong focus that we do on issues of safety and security um, so that you know, we can provide maximum reassurance that the direction we're going. And I also think it's important not to undersell what we are doing 
together within the, the European environment among the countries that are, that are like-minded and willing to go ahead. And there I, I just mentioned um, uh, the SET plan, the Strategic Energy Technologies Plan, where there's the Action 10 in the SET plan recently um, agreed a, a, a sort of uh, a roadmap for action um, among a surprisingly large number of member states that are committed to working together in this area um, through the European cooperation platforms. So, you know, I think it's a debate which will, which will evolve. Um, I think we do have to think quite hard about why it is that we are not able to win the argument in some communities and, and, and do what we can to address that. But, um, but I think the good news is that indeed um, uh, that there is a recognition that uh, a, a strong component of nuclear is likely to be for the foreseeable future uh, a part of our energy mix. And if um, uh, perhaps sooner than some people expect we can include a big dimension of uh, fusion in that, um, then I think we'll all be very happy. But I think even Bernard in his more um, optimistic moments would not expect a big component of fusion energy uh, before 2050, yes, Paul? Serious, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, we need to have an alternate to the fossil fuel burning. Mm. Okay, as I explained to you, this project here and demonstrating the hydrogen fusion capability is very challenging because, uh, you know, you could imagine what's happened in the sun, for example. Okay, the size, the complexity. But uh, we are on the road, and I am pleased to say, since I take okay, the responsibility of the project in 2015, we are uh, getting absolutely all the milestones we have expected. Yeah. And still now, I believe that 2025 will be the first plasma. And to be frank with you, it will be a real breakthrough in absolutely. the world of energy technologies. So once it is demonstrated, I have no doubt that the utilities, the industry, will take advantage of this. I, have a, I am a generation which came with okay, the very early days of electronics. Looks what's happened in 30 years. Okay? Now it's uh, largely distributed. Nobody could imagine at that time what was the performance. So once, okay, there is a need. And there is a need to find alternate options for energy production. Okay? If it is demonstrated as technologically viable, things move very fast. And so it is the responsibility now of all generation, and including okay, the European Commission, to push in such a way that these demonstrations are convincing in such a way that we know. It is research. Nobody knows never if it will succeed. But I like what some people told me. I want to know if fusion is an option. Personally, I want to know. Thank you. Um. If you mind, I would like to have one short um, follow-on question to that because there was some really interesting points that was mentioned there and it goes back to something that I know many people are quite interested in and it's about um, the wide-reaching benefits of nuclear technologies as a whole. Um, it's not only actually in, in energy, as, as we know, there's many aspects where nuclear technologies are giving benefits to society. and um, there's this fantastic opportunity. We're all here very interested about um, Horizon Europe. And um, what's your views on opportunities with Horizon Europe, your atom going forward, to really push forward synergies and collaboration, developing um, research and innovation in, in areas that um, maybe in the past have not really been um, developed as much in collaboration? How can we bring the communities together and, and where are the opportunities in doing so? <laughs> no, no, no I, maybe I'm not most qualified either. So, anyhow, I think that um, it is under the the applications of fission are by the overall public underestimated or unknown for a big. So, if you go to the medic the medical world, for instance, the world nuclear, even if you're taking in a, a magnetic resonance uh, scan. It's, it used to be NMR, now it's NMRI, now it's MRI. So people are afraid of the word nuclear. The word nuclear should not appear, but these are nuclear techniques. And as I said during my, my little presentation, the developments that we have today in nuclear medicine, they are incredible. For many, many years, we 
at ACK, we produced with the BR2 reactor, we produced 25% of the world's needs on Molly 99 today. But the new medicine that comes up today, it really will be enormous. Lutetium-177, actinium-225, these are very promising tools that come up. And we see that uh, where we were at the baseline with the Molly for diagnostic, now therapeutic is coming up almost exponentially. I think these are applications that people don't know and for which a lot of collaboration can be done. And this also puts ahead of time that really fission technology is extremely important because this is the way how you get there. It's fission induced. It can also be accelerator induced, but still fission is, let's say, the yields are much higher, uh, the possibility. This is also why I stress the fact, also for fusion, that we need research reactors. We are the, the research reactors in Europe, we only have a few that are left today that are operational. France had to close their down. They now will come up with the Jules Horowitz. I would wish it, would, it should already be there. But it takes a long time today to make these uh, pieces of equipment. But these are fundamental tools that we need. And I dare to say that if Europe does not put any priority on those tools to be there, then we will all have problems later, even for fusion, but also for the next generation of nuclear power plants, also for all the applications that we think are useful for society. Um, and I can give other examples uh, like silicium doping. Maybe most people don't know, but the best, every piece of renewable equipment contains something that was nuclear produced with a nuclear research reactor. People mostly don't know. The best semiconductors are produced that way, and you need them, otherwise you cannot transport high voltages, high currents. These are all applications that help society to develop. Uh, so it is important. If I may just to give an example. We are building this large facility as ITER. We have kilometers, uh, hundreds of kilometers of pipe to weld. Without, for example, the non-destructive testing, which is made okay, with some radiation coming from the nuclear materials, we will be lost. Okay, so, as you said, provide we uh, uh, operate uh, on a very uh, strict known condition, okay, this material, it works very well. It works very well, and I agree with you. We need to uh, not uh, okay, miss how important it is to keep on with highly qualified person, okay, resources which are dedicated to producing some of this material in safe condition. Yeah, Patrick, Can I, please, I, just add, I, mean, I mean, I think you know, we fully agree, and one of the reasons yeah, yeah, that yeah, indeed in our new proposal yeah. for the next uh, generation of the, the Euratom um, uh, research and training program, we do put emphasis on these non-power applications, um, and for the reasons that you say, and in the different areas, uh, building on what we've done in, in the medical research, but also um, in, in areas like industrial processes, uh, space research, um, and agriculture. And that brings also into play the importance of working more and more in synergy with what we're doing in other parts of the Horizon Europe program and in other EU programs. So, you know, and that, that's very much the sort of a, approach that we're trying to develop. Um, is to break silos and build synergies and, and seize opportunities. And that's why I think it's great that we've got this sort of uh, nuclear session as part of the broader conversations that are going on, on during this conference on you know, the future direction of research and innovation. I think that we also, and I mean, I, I want to, I mean, to congratulate um, ITER and, 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 and the progress that you're, you're making. I mean, we are very committed to ITER, as you know, um, and we are hugely impressed by the, uh, particularly under the leadership of uh, Bernard, that the project has been making in recent uh, years. And the, the spin-off benefits of nuclear research for other technologies. I mean, some of the things that you're achieving in this sort of massive scale um, precision engineering to make the project work are things which are going to be of, of huge benefit to the rest of society. I was very impressed when I visited the JET project a few months ago uh, to see what they were doing in terms of um, uh, remote uh, sort of repairs using, what was it called, uh, robotics um, in very hostile environments, which of course, pretty hostile in the middle of a, a tokamak when it's functioning, uh, but, but there are many other hostile environments in space or elsewhere. And that these benefits too, we need to be, you know, sort of uh, proactive and, 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 you know, in promoting as being things that are directly linked to the work that we're doing in the nuclear sector. Okay.
you for letting me have those two short questions. Now your turn. So there's a hand going up there, gentlemen. You, no, there's, think, a special, um, there's a special thing. Are you, we, we must use I believe, it. No? No, I the, believe. The tube, huh? Yeah. You, maybe you <laughs> want to give your name, where you're from. And then um, we have a box, microphone box, eh? This works, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm uh, Lambert van Eyck, I'm from the Netherlands. I represent the European Neutron Scattering Association. So those are, most of them are scientists that do, basically they do uh, material research, but there are also people that do fundamental research with, uh, with, uh, with neutrons. Um, so my own background, I'm from Delft. We, have the, we, have, uh, we are lucky that we have a small research reactor at the university in Delft. And, and uh, uh, so I actually do research on, for instance, uh, nuclear materials, where the neutrons, they see the oxygen in, uh, in a heavy metal matrix. Um, there, there are colleagues that work with positrons that actually investigate uh, uh, fusion materials. Uh, there's, a, there's a big group working on thorium reactors. That's also something I think which was not mentioned. And what I would like to uh, uh, mention here that there's a lot of uh, material research that is being done at the neutron scattering facilities and there has been uh, I think a year or two years ago well, roughly a year ago there has been this S3 uh, report about large-scale infrastructures mm -hmm. uh, neutron uh, sources are typically large-scale infrastructures because you need a reactor or a spallation source and um, I think my community, the, so the European Neutron Scattering uh, community, uh, they are suffering now because more and more of these research reactors are closing down and the spallation sources, they are coming up, but there is a gap in between those two. And um, I think, uh, so I think there's a lot of contribution from the, from the, uh, from the community and they are very much experts in solving all these, quest all these problems in fusion and in new fission reactors. And I, I fear that this community will be going, uh, d doing other things than, uh, and, and we will lose the expertise if we don't have the infrastructure. And the infrastructure are closing down more and more. And my, what I would refer to in the, in the scheme of Horizon Europe is that this infrastructure, uh, uh, the budget for infrastructure is, is, uh, has, has decreased and, um, I would like to opt that we try also in the Euratom scheme to put the uh, to put also infrastructure to put an emphasis on that so that we sh are sure that also the user community the community of those infrastructures they are uh, they are alive and renewed uh, because at this moment it's getting more and more difficult to do experiments and to solve uh, solve problems. Um, very interesting points there. Well, passionate um, statements and it's, it's good to hear. Um, I could try and paraphrase a few of them while well, well, one gets passed over there. Do you think there's a question, or maybe I could pick apart what you're saying about um, collaboration between fission and fusion, um, also talking about infrastructures as well and people, mobility. Um, for me, that I, I took away some of those points. Maybe there's a statement someone could make. I fully agree that what you say, there's a huge, huge community that's using neutrons today, and that is really fundamental in order to, to proceed. And all of them, or many of them, they depend upon these somewhat bigger infrastructures. It's also a means to get people together. So you really get international collaboration by doing this. The only problem that we have is that we are 28 or maybe 27 countries in the future within Europe, and we all want our piece of equipment. And this is why our budgets, they are cut in little pieces, and we don't, we are not able to make one or two big infrastructures. If we don't have these infrastructures, then people should not say, why is our countries like, um, like China or like India, why are they capable of making these things in Russia? They are capable of doing it because they put the money on one thing. Maybe they have a lot of money too, but they put the money on one thing and they make it. We all want to have our own peace. It's a Belgian attitude also. We always want something that's our own. But I think it's very important that we should learn within Europe that we have to put down some priorities. Like, for instance, the one that's put on ITER. It's extremely important, but we have to put priorities if we want to secure 
our future in the nuclear fission field. If we don't do that, if we keep on spreading everything here and there, everyone, everyone will like it, but we will end up not by having good infrastructures. And that's my personal view. And it's not because we are constructing Mira. In France, you can see the Astrid project was there. There are a lot of projects that are trying to come up, and they, they are stopped somehow. Just a word. It's clear with the development of science, we go beyond frontiers. And in order to get it, uh, OK, um, we need equipment which are more and more complex, more and more costly. If we are not able to have a global planning, OK, how to proceed, and including in Europe, at the level of Europe, and it's why okay, Europe has a big role to play, we will not be able to afford. A good example is ITER. ITER, okay, many people want to know about fusion. The size of his equipment, the complexity of his equipment is such that not a single country, even the most powerful now, could afford to develop an ITER project in a reasonable time. So it's why, <laughs> under the pressure of the event, all these 35 different countries, seven members, has agreed to develop this project for 32 years because it's a unique equipment which is needed. When it will be successful, there will be many more, okay, maybe equipment, but for the time being, it is what is needed. And I feel that ITER is a very good example that okay, people realize that if they are, as you said, scattered with small equipment, which uh, is needed, we, it's like uh, in computing. If you have just a big computer, you know, it will not be uh, mm -hmm. efficient. We need also to have all the scaling. We need to have some domestic program or supporting, as you said, but not maybe with the top scaling issue. Yeah. We have one question probably left. Yeah, time for one question or? Okay, well, uh, two points. One is I told, well, sorry, my name is Tony Dunay, Eurofusion. Um, so, um, uh, one point is that I totally agree with the fact that we need fusion, uh, fission reactors for also testing uh, uh, fusion materials. So, the neutron uh, facilities like mentioned. Uh, what we see now is for the Eurofusion program, we have to rely on reactors in the United States, HIFER, uh, we are using Bor 60 in Russia simply because we don't have enough facilities in Europe. So, it's really important. What I would like to emphasize there also is that we need a 14 MeV neutron facility and I'm very glad that Donis is now also in the S3 roadmap and I hope that that would be constructed in the early 20s. The other important point is that we need to get away from the stigma about nuclear because many people have the impression that nuclear is totally unsafe and if I count on the world how many people died by nuclear uh, incidents over the world, that's, that's peanuts. And every, every day, thousands of people are dying because of cancers, which they basically develop because of inhalation. I have the pleasure now to live in Germany. In Germany, they are sponsoring wind and solar by 25 billion euro per year. It's, it's one eater per year, Bernard. And they, Germany could build an eater on its own, but they're just not doing it. And what happens? Germany has 40% of the energy comes from renewables. What has been happening? The CO2 emission due to electricity generation in Germany is still the same as in 2011 when they started with the Energiewende. 50% uh, of that energy is used to replace nuclear, which is being phased out. And the other 20% Germany is exporting because many days they have too much wind, they don't know what to do with the energy and they're paying neighboring countries to take their energy. It's a very weird uh, system we have because we are investing a lot of money and still the CO2 is not going down. And we really need to convince people that nuclear can be done in a very safe way. I'm not talking about fission or fusion. I think at the end we, we need them both, fission in the short term, in the long term, fusion uh, I think should be also on the agenda. Final statements. Well, I, no, no, I just want to add. That, okay, we know very well the, the situation of, of Germany. I have been working before I had this job for 20 years on the safety of nuclear power plants. And I can only state, and maybe the German systems that I found that I studied for so many years were the safest ones. They are the safest ones. They are the most. And so it's, it, is, it is something 
this is what I wanted to say in the beginning. Politics is good, but if, if this governs what science should bring, then we are on a difficult path. Um, and so this is all. I think it's fully correct what you say. On donors, I think it's, it's, it's also, of course, I forgot to mention that it's also a very important tool to be put, donors or if me later on. But still important today is that these facilities will only be able to look at a limited amount of materials, a limited quantity of materials. And for fusion, Eurofusion, you will have to make a selection out of 20, 30 different materials, which are the best candidates. All those candidates cannot pass these two installations. You have to do this with a fast neutron research reactor. It's the only way to do it. You make a first selection, and then for the final selection, you can use these other installations because they will have the neutron spectrum that goes the nearest to the one that fusion needs. One more thing. The tokamak is the central part, the central part of a fusion reactor. If those materials are not well qualified and you get problems with these materials, then you get problems with the whole system. And it's not, unless Bernard says the opposite, it is not easy to reach those materials once everything is constructed. Qualify. Okay, thank you. Uh, is, are there any, Patrick, would you want to have a last uh, well, word? Well, I mean, just to thank everyone for coming um, and to, I think, um, you know, I mean, I don't think anyone in this room needs to be convinced about the importance or the opportunities that nuclear technologies mm -hmm. offer for us in this broader debate on decarbonisation, right? Um, but, and, and nor are we, any of us, blind to the huge opportunities that there are there and the opportunities that we see, in particular of working at a European level, if, whether it's to overcome you know, the challenges of fragmentation of resources for, for, um, uh, for the heavy, large infrastructures, whether it's about providing an effective platform uh, to you know, exchange best practice, to rebuild the next generation of uh, nuclear scientists, or to forge into new areas of the sort, you know, medical and other sorts of research that we've, uh, what we've talked about. Uh, but in order to, uh, we, we can't ignore the fact that the, the political context is what it is. And I think that we need, therefore, to think about, you know, creative ways of uh, advancing, you know, taking account of that reality, uh, not just sort of mm. pretending it doesn't exist or wishing it away. Okay, I think that with these last words, uh, I, mean, I think that you have actually summarized uh, quite well, actually, because uh, we have, you know, um, a Euratom research and training program, uh, which is uh, a provider uh, of cooperation within the EU. It's a framework for cooperation, but it needs to be also respectful of the priorities and the choices of the member states. So we will continue to work with the member states. We will continue to work with the stakeholders. This is for us the beginning of a process, of a co-creation process as well, also for us in our small way within Euratom. And, um, uh, we will uh, uh, find uh, we will we will find a way and we will test the ways uh, of uh, engaging uh, with the citizens and with society in a constructive way to make uh, to make them un hopefully understand that uh, uh, Europe is a leader in this technology and there is nothing to uh, worry about that we are also safe and the, uh, the reactor technologies are needed uh, and uh, they have impact on, on society and on everyday life in ways that uh, we are mostly ignoring. So um, I hear about uh, other, uh, um, other concerns, uh, fragmentation, need for capacity. I will never uh, uh, stress enough uh, uh, I think the need to continue to engage the young generations uh, because without them uh, there will be no fusion, no ITER, uh, no research reactors, uh, there will be no innovation, there will be no research. So we really need all to make an effort to engage with the young uh, generations and uh, make them part of our dream so that they can also dream and they turn this dream into reality when we pass the baton to them. Um, I think I want to just uh, to thank our, now our uh, speakers, if we can give them a big round of applause, all four of them, and including Nathan.
last word. Please do not forget, we have an exhibition, Science for All, in Turin Taxes. Go and see it. And we have also an exhibition area here in Canal, where there is the Eater Cinema, so you can have a look in a virtual reality cinema where you can actually experience ITER. So go and have a look at it. And Operation Tomacamac from Eurofusion. So please go and see it. Thank you very much for everybody. Good.